Hello, I'm Kim Sauer at What's New in Electronics, live in the What's New in Electronics TV studio. I'm welcoming you here to a live panel discussion about Brexit, the implications for the electronics manufacturing industry. And I've got a great panel here. Welcome to the stage, uh, Andrew Maddock, a CEO of um, SMS, uh, EMS company, Michael Ford, Benta Graphics, and um, Claire Saunders, who is the organizer of What's uh, New in Electronics. So welcome again now. Brexit, big, uh, uh, big topic. It's one that everybody is discussing. Lots of different views um, on that. And really, what I want to find out is how, what sort of impact has it had already? And then we'll look at the future. Um, but when, when the when the vote came in, obviously, um, already people started f started to feel some effect. So, if I start with you, Andrew, what, from your point of view. Did it change anything? Um, for us, in uh, I guess the initial uh, problems we experienced was the the Brexit vote and the the subsequent leave um, had an almost instant impact on the the exchange rate of the pound. Um, so both against the dollar, the yen, and the euro, and of course all components um, that we buy, none of them are manufactured natively in GBP. So almost overnight, we started to see price increases. Um, we were able, as a, an EMS company, to use some of the stocks that we preferred to delay, um, you know, discussions we had to have with customers with price increases. But ultimately, uh, when you're facing material increases of circa 15 or 20 percent, that's meant that we've had to put prices up to customers. Um, for some of those customers, it's been a, a manageable problem where they're exporting. Obviously, they've um, they've had the benefit of the exchange rate the other way in terms of increased margins, and they've been able to accommodate the movement in pricing. With other customers that are UK-centric, it's been a real battle. Um, and in some cases, we're seeing that you know, the, the increase in raw material prices has actually led our customers to be non-competitive. Um, so that's the initial impact. Going forward, um, you know, we're seeing a little bit of stability now, but it's a big unknown. You know, as we go towards Brexit, we don't know what shape and feel Brexit's going to look like, what the trade room is going to be like. So we certainly see a lot of volatility. Um, you know, we look towards the experts in, in terms of forecasts and what's going to happen. You can ask three different people and get three different answers. So it's trying to manage and, and limit the, the vulnerability. And I suppose we're going to get three different answers here as well. It's the, the immediate impact, that's already quite an interesting thing. And, uh, and I guess there will be multiple impacts as, as things develop. Um, from your point of view, and, and also Claire's, if you want to jump in, what apart from the financial impact and the, the, the reaction that then the customers have, uh, how has it af affected the, 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 the health, I suppose, of the UK manufacturing industry? Um, for me, I, I'm kind of a little bit disappointed. I mean, no matter how the decision had gone, there would have been a reaction. Mm -hmm. And that reaction is, is immediate. I mean, we saw, as you said, the exchange rates and all of the international trade does depend a lot on, on exchange rates and uh, let's say taxes between borders and we can all start to imagine oh dear you know we're going to have to pay a lot more for imported goods but we're quite a way away from anything happening in reality I it's like the initial reaction has come with an expectation of something that's going to happen and really we have a little bit of time so okay what's going to happen initially is going to happen anyway there's probably very little we can do about it but what we need to do then is to look at the next step because we could, for example, adopt a negative attitude to say, OK, we've got exchange rate problems, we've got uh, issues of taxes bringing goods into the UK. But then also that gives us a positive outlook to say, well, hang on, we could now start to make things in the UK more efficiently and better. And that drives the technology and innovation within manufacturing forward so that we see those kinds of things happening here rather than elsewhere. So it gives us an opportunity to start to catch up and overtake and become that center of excellence. What we need to do is to find out how do we make that happen. Rather than reacting and getting upset about all of the immediate responses, let's actually make a plan from the real people who know, who are the voices of the industry, and let's execute on that plan. It's quite interesting because obviously the split was almost 50-50. So and you know the, the culture that we now live in you know no one likes to lose but then we're not very competitive because we all want to be winners but we haven't got the drive so ed someone's going to be upset there's half the country going one way half the country going the other way so it's a bit like a breakup so it's like a relationship 
you know, one of you doesn't want to be with the other one. So it hurts. Someone's upset, someone's hurt, and they're going to react. So they're going to, well, I, I mean, not that I've done this, but, you know, tear their clothes up, you know, throw things in the bin, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, put fish in their shoes and, you know, all that sort of thing. I've heard about these things. So... You've thought this through. <laughs> Lots of times. <laughs> but however, that's the sort of thing that happens. So it's an immediate reaction. So we've had a breakup. We've had a relationship breakup and there's been a reaction. But the point of the fact is we all run businesses. We all need to continue to run a business and we all need to work. We're not going to stop <coughs> working with people overseas because we can't. You know, people are not going to stop buying um, aeroplane parts or they're not going to do this and that because we're not part of Europe. We're not going to stop eating brie. We're not going to stop buying from France. We're not going to stop buying from Germany. It's, it, it, it has to work out. And we don't know what's going to happen because we're so far away from it actually being implemented. However, the immediate reaction was, oh, my goodness. And we saw a, rea we saw a reaction. Everybody saw a break in business. Everyone panicked. Everything stopped. But it's coming back because we have a choice. We either say, okay, we, we live in this whatever situation is, the doldrums, or we carry on and we continue and we do business because if we don't then we may as well close our doors and i think that's what's happening it's so really it's an attitude it's a uh, it, it, we we need to talk about it communicate it and have a positive outlook as to how we deal with the situation but i suppose it's change and change is often difficult for people to accept particularly when it's uncertain change so let's talk about the uncertainty uh, you know where wh how uncertain are we or are there s certain things that we can be certain about or less certain about? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, that's what Claire said. The, the certain thing is that Brexit's going to happen. Yeah, um, it's, it's no more than two years away. Um, the uncertainty is what shape and form any agreement with Europe is going to be post the negotiations. So what I see with our customers now is affecting what strategic decisions they're looking to make. But also they have to create multiple strategic options um, to to example I example that um, you know a customer that's manufacturing in the UK now exporting to Europe they don't know what barriers to export they're going to have in two years time so they're looking at continuing the model they've got now and the potential implications but also exploring things like having split manufacturing manufacturing in point of, of territory in Europe or maybe having distribution centers in Europe to get around these um, potential barriers that are unknown yet so really it's 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 posed a lot more questions than simply is it good to be in or is it out we've got to think about lots of different scenarios depending on the negotiations that haven't yet happened i also think that we have to um have a stronger front moving forward because i think the issue that we have at the moment is it very much as if you know there's half it, there's there's a breakup in, in in relationships internally so how is that being perceived externally if we can't show a united front of where we are, what we're doing, then we are, it's a weakness. And we're not weak. We have to show that we're strong. And going back to the Innovations Forum earlier on today, we were talking about the expertise, the quality that we have in the UK. So let's not show ourselves as, you know, we've, you know, we've, we've lost a battle. You know, we haven't. It's, it's, it's the next step. It's, the, it's, it's happening. We've got to deal with it. It's how we deal with it. And we have to externally now portray ourselves as winners and innovators interesting thing there is that um, a lot of the time you hear oh we've lost the battle or we should we should be thinking positively over 50 percent of people wanted this so th there should be positivity around anyway so it's uh, w why are we i know the vote was very close but uh, w why do we tend to talk more about therefore at the moment the, the negatives and the uncertainty than actually celebrating that we got what the people voted for you know I think it's uh, it's a broader issue than just the brexit vote itself because if you think about it what what motivated people uh, to they want to believe in the UK being strong again I mean we, we want to have that positivity and so you know, just putting brexit aside you know we see the decline in our industries in manufacturing over many years and something kind of is lost, you know, the, the ability to create actual tangible value in the things that we're making, uh, to take the ideas. I mean, the UK's always had fantastic ideas um, about new products and technologies, and we see these going elsewhere to be developed. 
we really need to solve a core fundamental problem about how to support those technologies, how to support that manufacturing. And I think we've had it a little bit easy from Europe because we see a lot of grants that have come in to help these companies develop products, only to see them ultimately go elsewhere. We need to find a way to allow those ideas, to allow manufacturing to develop again in the UK, supported by the UK government, perhaps paid for by money that is generated by a cross-border flow of products. So in essence, if we can use that resource wisely, if we can really support the ideas and innovations that we have, then this can be a great success. And I think that's what people were aiming for, Brexit vote or not. That's what people want anyway. And I think the Brexit was a symptom of that. And I also think, you know, love or loathe him, and most of us have one opinion or the other, um, Donald Trump, you know, he wants to make America great again. Isn't that what we want? We want a great Britain again, or, you know, a United Kingdom. And obviously we have the political issues, but we have to move towards that. And however you voted, however you, you know, made the decision that you made, we are where we are, and we need to make sure that we push forward and show our strengths, show our capabilities, because it's huge. I'm going to dig a little bit deeper now and talk about people, because in a way people are also what, who will be driving these attitudes, but people are also the people that are manufacturing in our factories. Now, a lot of these people aren't actually British or they're, they're, they're from the European Union and they've come over and now there's this big discussion of, uh, you know, can they stay, can they not stay, what are the barriers there? Uh, where do we see that going? Because a lot of these people are actually a lot cheaper to maintain or to have in our factories manufacturing. So, you know, are, are we losing that? What do we have to do to keep them? Has anyone asked them to leave? Are we asking people to leave if they're working? I mean, actually, has anyone said, you've got to leave? Or are we perceiving that that's what's got to happen? I think people are perceiving that because nobody's made a decision on it yet, as far as I know, personally. Um, but certainly there's a panic out there. And, and, and on one hand, people are saying, this is great because we're, we're, we're British and we want to have our, our job. But I, I don't know. I mean, uh, really, the question to you is, you know, what, what's happening on that front? Um, well, for first response is, OK, European labour isn't cheaper in the UK. Okay, because we have we have laws and we have minimum wages, so it's, it's not like we pay European labour. But like a lot of manufacturing companies, particularly in electronics, we have a very diverse workforce. Okay, so about forty percent of our workforce is is, is non UK. Um, I think the biggest benefit for us of the European projects has been access to the right skills um, across across Europe. So if you need a particular skill set, you can go and employ it. Um, if um, you know, worst case the the, the European uh, workforce is forced to go home or the, the amount you can import is cut, it's going to force an emphasis on homegrown development. Okay, So that means that the, the universities, the apprenticeship schemes, they're going to have to be tailored to produce the right quality of skill set at the end of it. What we find is we take the, the, the output of the, the UK system as it is at the moment, and you still need to invest in training to take the education structure and the apprentices and deploy it in a way that you need it. Um, and in with some ways with the European labour you can go and import it and have it ready made because it's got experience of working in your technology um, it's something we've addressed through having tailored schemes and it's something that I think we'll have to put a lot more focus and effort into Yeah I think especially in the UK I mean when we go to school or when we go to college we kind of have aspirations for the kind of work we want to do after that and I think historically if you go back people would have a lot of uh, apprentice schemes and people would be introduced into different areas of manufacturing um, and you know it would be interesting for them. I think in recent times that's not been the case. Manufacturing is the one thing that's not interesting anymore. But people are still there doing all types of jobs from the very highest level of jobs all the way down you know, throughout the whole gamut of <laughs> the employment spectrum. There will be people who would like to work in manufacturing. And we have to kind of explain to these people what manufacturing is, because it isn't what we had before we joined the EU. It isn't actually people doing you know, things with spanners and oily bits and having to put parts in the board and not move or talk to anybody else all day. Those kinds of jobs are in the decline. However, what is actually replacing them 
is technology that's coming in. So you have more room for engineering jobs, not necessarily just the high levels of engineering, but for operators doing their own engineering, introducing their own innovations within an area that they're responsible for. The workplace has changed so much, but what we need to do is to really sell that workplace now and to get people interested in working in manufacturing in this country, being proud of what they make as a result. I mean, I don't know how many of you have been to university campuses recently, but you, look, you go to a university campus and it's 80% international. You know, that, that we're not educating internally and we are giving people the skills to take technology overseas, which is great, you know, and it's important. However, you know, if the situation comes where we say, no, sorry, you can't come in, and, and the schools are going to they're going to suffer because obviously they're not going to get the funding. Um, so th these opportunities aren't going to be so available. However, you know we want to we want to imp we want to do stuff internally. We want to build our country back up again. So if we f we we make the youngsters engage with industry, we need new people. We need young people to get involved. So if it forces us to make sure that we push them in that direction. You know, the kids don't talk to each other. They play on their phones. They do everything on something electronic. Do they really realise that what this is makes those things? And I don't think they do, because you know, we 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 we, uh, we, we have a, our son who now works with us, and he came to Electronica, and he was like, "Oh my God, look at that! Oh my God!" I didn't realise, and I was like, you know, how do you think it's made? But they don't care about how it's made. They care about what it does. And they want it better and faster and, you know, quality. So we need to make our industry sexy. Mm. And it's, it's, it's difficult because it's not, but it is amazing. You know, we are the, we are the innovators. That the world will stop without what we do. Okay, well, this is great because you started off by throwing, or you were putting paint onto somebody's car and throwing their clothes out and fish, doing <laughs> fish and all that to now... Uh, transforming ourselves into something sexy. This is so we're, we're already <laughs> in the next level of, of recovery after the breakup. This is this is lovely. So in order to to obviously build further on that, um, whose responsibility is it? Is it a shared responsibility? How much responsibility will government have in this? How much responsibility do we each as an individual or as a company have to become more sexy and and make Britain great? Government have a huge responsibility. And do you know right now, government don't even recognise electronics as a key sector because it doesn't fit. They don't understand it. So where does it sit? Um, that, that's kind of ridiculous because uh, I, I think that electronics... It's not my words. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, electronics isn't just electronics anymore. I mean, if you look around at how many different products we have, how many computers we have in the cars, for example, that we're making. I mean, almost every device you buy, from a washing machine to a Hoover to a, even a central heating controller, it's got mechanical stuff in there, and it's got electronics. Electronics is absolutely everywhere. Electronics ought to be booming. It ought to be doing like 10 times growth every year from what we see in our daily lives. Why isn't it? But I think if you ignore electronics, you're ignoring all physical industry. And if you ignore physical industry, you're concentrating on things that have no tangible value. I mean, software companies may, you know, we see the headlines, people make billions of dollars on an app over a couple of years, but a couple of years later, the assets turn to zero, because unless people are interested in continuing to use it, there's no tangible remain. Mm. And so y you're just paper-based money now. It's not something real. The investment in hardware of, you know, things that are tangible, things that we use as, as people in the UK, this is important because that is actually adding value, and it's a value that remains. And so if we forget that, if we forget electronics, the vital element of that, then it's almost like we're giving up, and that's really sad. So I think we need, as an industry, to make government see the different options they have going forward and to put our version of the way we think things should be and what we need to do to make it happen. Because without that, they can't make the right decision. That's right, and if we don't fast forward on our skyboxes, obviously electronics, um, if we actually look at the adverts, Great Britain is exporting. That's what they're telling us. They're putting adverts out all over the place and telling us the future is export. You know, we have to build relationships. So why they need to recognize what we've got here. It's, it's fundamental, and, and, and it has to come from us. We have to shout 
about what we've got. And, and it frustrates me so much. So that's why my voice is a bit wobbly, because I want to scream. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'd just like to be on what Claire said. Um, you know, electronics isn't sexy, but at the same time, as Michael said, it's everywhere. Um, if you were to ask some of my customers what they, their experience is in terms of recruitment, they advertise for a software engineer and they'll get 100 applicants for every job. They advertise for an electronics hardware engineer and they're struggling to find people. And that's the difference. Electronics is sexy because of the software and the applications get that written on the electronics. Designing it isn't sexy. You know, designing it is the down and dirty. Um, and, and that's where I think a lot more investment needs to come. And in terms of the government investment, the government is investing in advertising and manufacturing, but it's around the core tertiary industries in the UK. It's aerospace, it's rail, it's auto manufacture. It's the, the sensationalization of the, the jobs, keeping the jobs in the UK. You know, even some of the Brexit discussions are about keeping those industries in the UK, um, even to the potential of subsidizing them if barriers to trade or export do come into place. You know, for the smaller, um, you know, based manufacturing that support all of those industries, there's a challenge, and I don't think government is going to pick up the mantle. So the, the responsibility really does lie with the, the local forums, the lobbying committees, and the, the companies themselves to actually pick it up and do something about it. Clearly a very uh, complicated uh, uh, debate to have and lots of facets to it. Thank you very much once again for your participation. Uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm very positive that we, we are going in the right direction. We've, we've uh, recognized you know, it is going to happen, so we have to deal with it. So thank you once again. Um, and um, good luck with the rest of the show here. Thank you.